Welcome again. Like I said, I'm Allison Cohen. I'm the current president of Plato, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome you to our third webinar. Um, we've been really excited with the reception that these webinars have received and um, are excited to connect with everyone virtually when we cannot connect uh, with you in person. Um, I would encourage you, for those of you who might not be familiar with Plato's work, to check out our website um, to get to know the organization a little bit better. Uh, two things that I just wanted to bring to your quick attention. We have um, a conference coming up next June, June 24th and 25th at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, so we highly encourage you to come join us there so that we can meet you in person. Uh, also, additionally, if you are inspired by any of the ideas that you hear tonight, we would encourage you to submit a call, uh, submit a paper, um, submit a presentation idea for the conference. The call for papers um, is on our website. You can find that information there. And the deadline for that call for papers is January 15th. Yes, January 15th. The second thing that I wanted to bring your attention to, since I'm assuming that a lot of us might be educators in the, in the virtual room tonight, we have a journal, Plato's uh, host a journal called Questions uh, that features the philosophical works of our young philosophers. So for those of you who are teachers, I would highly encourage you to check out our current edition of Questions, which will be up on our website in PDF format. Um, and to encourage them to submit to our next edition of questions. We'd love to hear uh, from young people and we love that we are able to publish their works uh, in our journal questions. So for those of you who are, are familiar with Plato, our moderator for this evening truly needs no introduction. Um, but for those of you who do not already know Jan or more alone, uh, allow me to just briefly introduce her. She is the director um, of, the, of a Children's Philosophy Center at the University of Washington in Seattle, um, and is also the author of several books on P for C, uh, pre-college philosophy for children. Uh, her most recent work is Seen and Not Heard, Why Children's Voices Matter. Um, she is certainly a leader in the field, to say the least, and we are so privileged to have her working with us and to have her here moderating this discussion tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jana um, and welcome again. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So nice to see all of you here. And thank you, Allison, for that very generous introduction. Um, I'm going to say just a couple of things about the plan for this evening. I'm so excited that we have high school teachers from all over the country to talk with us about their work. The way that we're going to run this is each, I will introduce each teacher right before they speak, and each teacher will speak for about 10 minutes. At the end of those five talks, then we will go into breakout rooms. So we'll have five breakout rooms, one for each speaker, and you're, you will be invited to choose the breakout room where the speaker who you have questions for or just would like to talk more with will be. And I'll say that again when we get to the breakout room piece. Um, so I will start by introducing our first speaker, Mary Zoe Bowden, who lives in Florida. And she has taught something in every grade from pre-kindergarten through college level classes. She says that she loves asking questions and tries to remember she doesn't always have the answers. Very important for a philosopher. So Mary Zoe, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here, it's an honor, and I'm so glad to see so many of you as well. Um, so um, I think most of us that are gonna talk tonight are gonna address the question of what are the benefits of introducing philosophy to high school students? And then also what have the challenges been? And so I'll start with the benefits. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a, I, in order to keep myself um, kind of limited and organized, I, I created a little document that I will be happy to, um, I can put it in the chat and I, a link to it in the chat, and I can also share my screen. Um, whoops, that's not the right copy thing, just a moment. <laughs> um, I'll share my screen so you can uh, also keep me honest, and I will, um, uh, I had it copied, and of course now I <laughs> copied something else. Um, so, okay, here we go. So here's the, um, 
a link to the document. It also has some, um, some links at the bottom to philosophy programs for young children, including the one at the University of Washington, Seattle, which is a, a fine program, of course. Um, and um, I will share my screen here so you can also see it this way. Okay, so um, I would start with the benefits. And I also broke it up into benefits for teachers and benefits for students, because clearly there are benefits for both. Um, so in terms of the benefits that I think teachers get out of it, the first one I put is friendships and relationships, because when you're talking philosophy, um, in, even in a classroom, the, the, the discussions often um, go beyond the, the walls of the classroom. You end up continuing the conversations in the hallways with students at the lunch table with students and with, with, with your colleagues and peers. So I find that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to create and, and um, you know, enjoy friendships with, with your colleagues and with students as well. Um, the enjoyment, um, if you love philosophy, you love teaching it. So that's a benefit. And also I find that it keeps you sharp. You have to, you know, keep always you know, looking for better ways to teach it, better ways to get kids engaged, more tools for your toolbox. So, um, so I, I think those are three benefits for teachers that are pretty clear. Benefits for students, I again, I put friendships because you, <laughs> you, know, you talk about, when you're talking philosophical questions, you're talking about things that you don't always talk about in every you know, conversation and that students sometimes wouldn't otherwise discuss with each other. So I think it does create friendships. Um, confidence, students who, um, who regularly participate in philosophical questions, feel much more prepared to engage in difficult and, dis and complex discussions um, outside of classes as well. Um, I think it increases their success in college classes, um, primarily because it um, makes them used to discussing um, in public and makes it used to sharing their views and um, speaking out. And it also, of course, increases their critical thinking abilities and skills. Um, I included maturity there because you have to be mature to be able to learn how to use the proper language to disagree with someone while still being respectful and treating them kindly. I think it teaches students empathy because they ideally at least are trying to imagine what it would be like to be in someone else's shoes when they're considering the different points of a particular perspective. And again, ideally, and perhaps theoretically, I'm hoping that it teaches them ethics, not only what they should do, but I hope it actually translates into what they do in their lives and they become better people, more just and, and thoughtful, reflective human beings. What are the challenges? Boy, I think the first challenge is your school culture buy-in. Um, I think there's nothing easier than saying, hey, I have a great STEM pro program. And everyone's going like, yeah, let's do it, you know, um, because it's science and math, you know. But when you talk, oh, you know, let's have some more philosophy so we can find, sp spend more time reclining at table and discussing, they're like, uh, what? <laughs> Why? So I think that's the first challenge is, is, is to create a school culture of buy-in. Um, <clears throat> And the school culture includes administration, you know, your colleagues, your students, and your student and your and the parents. You know, you have to have everyone ideally on board um, for it to succeed. Um, qualified teachers is another challenge. If you yourself are the only one who's going to be teaching it, I'm assuming most of you are pretty qualified, so that's probably not an issue. But if you wanted to have sustainability, so it would last after you left, or if you wanted to increase the size of your program, finding qualified teachers is a challenge. Um, the students themselves, sometimes students don't understand um, the purpose of a philosophy class. And so that takes some, you know, again, acculturation. And then this, the parents, um, the students who don't like the classes too much are likely to go home and say, man, we just had the dumbest class today. All we did is talk about nothing at all, you know, and then, then it takes, you know, again, a little bit of um, a little bit of working and massaging to help them understand why it is indeed important. Um, so what are the responses to some of these challenges? Um, I, you know, in terms of the school culture, um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. In other words, you have to um, recognize that you have to get administration on your side. You have to, you know, you have to convince your peers and colleagues why it's important. You have to talk to parents and kind of, you know, do a little bit of, um, you know, fertilizing the soil there in advance before you try to start jumping in with it. Um, qualified teacher challenge, start with you. After that, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Just, you know, be patient and, and you know, uh, ask around, I don't know. Um, the, the students, the how to overcome the students are the challenges. Uh, the challenge of the students not liking the class. Um, my experience is that very often students 
will come back later and recognize the value of it. So you have to put it in terms of long-term results. This is something you might not understand immediately. And you have to explain this to, to, to parents and administration as well, and they can support you on this. Um, so, you know, if a kid or a parent says, you know, I don't understand why my kid goes to a class where he just spends most of the class talking, um, you know, how can that be valuable? You know, it's, you know, years down the road when they recognize that little seed that's been planted starts to starts to grow and they recognize, well, maybe there was something to that. I think I talked about that when I was a, when I was a kid or something. So I think you have to recognize that some of this is students cannot recognize how or why it's important at the moment, but they will later. Um, that's important to realize. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to address are suggestions for beginning a high school philosophy class or unit. Um, and so forgive me if I'm talking too fast, but I'm trying to say a lot and I'm trying to keep it to about 10 minutes. So, okay, so um, the first part, the first thing I like to say is, you know, most of us teach things, um, even if it's not directly a philosophy class, we teach areas that we can either add a unit in philosophy or more likely just add philosophical questions and considerations to everything we do. So, you know, to start that, I would suggest, um, you know, normative questions. So, you know, when, if you, whether you're reading a, a piece in literature, whether it's a short story, a novel, a particular scene from a play, you can always ask the question, what should he or she do? And then the very important follow-up, why? Can you back that up with reasons? Why would you suggest that? So normative questions can be asked about any moment in history, can be asked about any you know, scientific theory or philosophy. Um, and, and certainly in literature, it's very easy to bring in normative questions. So that's one way I think that can be brought into almost every day and everything we do. I think another way thing we can do to teach philosophy in classes we're already teaching is to teach students the language of philosophy, teach them how to ask, ask questions um, about, um, you know, something like, well, what makes you say that, you know, asking, asking students to, um, even when they ask other students questions, to, to ask them to specify, to give reasons, um, and to, you know, to give them the language that helps them, um, helps them think philosophically and respond philosophically. And another thing we can always do is point out moral dilemmas. Um, you know, there are so many that happen on a daily basis that we talk about in current events and everything, you know. I think about the whole mask question, you know, the question is, you know, it, you know, it's a safety versus freedom, you know, it's a right versus a right, it's not a clear wrong one way or the other, you know, are you, are you more concerned about safety, are you more, more concerned about freedom? Um, and then point out these moral dilemmas on a regular basis. So, so those are ways, those are a few quick suggestions in terms of how you can um, add philosophy to the classes you already teach. Um, the other option is to either find a course or develop a course in philosophy for your, for your program. So, and again, I specified here, I have public school teachers and private school teachers. I think there's a slight difference at the beginning, but after that initial step, it looks pretty much the same. Public school teachers would have to um, check with your state department of education website, because chances are they have courses already created for your state, and you would be most likely to have to um, use something like that course. Um, so I would suggest checking there to begin with and then check, make sure that you have the proper credentials to teach that class. Um, for private school teachers, you would have to either write your own curriculum or find a curriculum. If you're gonna write your own, I suggest you use a lot of the online resources and or friends and colleagues at your school already to get some support because it's a lot to do on your own otherwise. And there are lots of options online that I have here at the bottom and I have them linked as well at the bottom. So I would suggest you look, start with some of those. Um, but then the most important thing is to garner interest. You're gonna have to drum up a lot of interest. Um, and the best way to garner interest is to start with the club. If you don't already have a, a, an ethics bowl club at your school, please start one. It's a lot of fun. And the kids, you know, it, it has, it's a wonderful program. It has a lot of curriculum available already. And, you know, it's just a matter of, getting a group of kids together, sitting down and, and you know, talking and enjoying it together. Um, and you know, again, use your relationships you already have with students. Start with a group of kids that you know well, that like you, that you've had in different classes before and say, hey, let's do this. It's, you know, it's gonna be a lot of fun. If you can get some school leaders, that's ideal. Cause then you can say, hey, if you join then you know you'll get all these other kids to join. So um, use your relationships with that. Um, I meet during lunch because the kids have so much going on after school already. Um, they have sports practices, they have jobs, they have everything else. So we meet during lunch. We bring our lunch to, to my classroom or someplace and we meet. And then um, also bring snackies. <laughs> bring 
make, make, make brownies for them, bring a bag of chips, whatever. But, but I find that, that that certainly encourages um, lots of kids to show if you have a little snack together. Um, keep your administration and parents informed. Make sure that you do things like um, of, of, of all the work you're doing. Submit pieces to the questions journal so you can say my philosophy kits are published in this journal. You know, use the resources that you have here in this group and um, and you know show show your administration, your colleagues, your parents, and your students that you're this is real work you're doing and it's important work and you know and it's fruitful work. Get some press that's kind of related to that if you possibly can. At the very least, use the use your school social media um, platforms, whatever that might be, to take pictures of your of yourselves meeting during lunch. Make sure that that you know if you get something published in in the questions journal or some other place, make sure that they're aware of that. You know, um, get some press and start with an elective. Um, can you get an an ethics bowl elective? Um, if after one year you can't do it. Rinse and repeat, you know, <laughs> take another year, do it again, get more kids involved. Um, don't stop trying. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, getting the kids who have been involved in your ethics school class um, to join your philosophy class, your ethics class. And, and I will say that the, you know, the year two when I've actually been able to have an ethics bowl class or class, you know, focus on ethics to prepare us for the ethics bowl, my kids have done very well and they've loved it and it's been very enjoyable. So, um, so that's my, those are my suggestions in terms of how you can find and develop a course. I think I'm um, a little over, I'm sorry. So I won't talk much longer, but I, the last thing I will say is that um, the, the most successful class that, that we've taught, the most successful philosophy class has been a class called Agape, Charitable Love. We found that the high school kids love talking about love. Um, they are fascinated by the topic. Um, and they, you know, as much as they can, they just want to talk about, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends and that type of flow, which is okay. We do some of that too as well. But we also throw in philosophical perspectives, history of love, you know, love and marriage in different cultures, you know, arranged marriages versus versus love marriages and, and a lot of other topics. So um, you can always, you know, if you can't think of any other topic, try a love course and kids will certainly enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Zo. Could you um, stop sharing your screen? Oh, yes, I sure can. <laughs> Let me see if I can figure this out. Stop share. There we go. How's that? There you go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. Well, I am very happy now to introduce Terrence McKittrick, who is a language arts teacher at Nova High School, which is a public alternative school in Seattle, Washington, and with whom I've worked for many years. He's been teaching philosophy there for over 21 years. Terrence, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jana. It's great to see you. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, I thought the first 10 minutes was just like, this is who I am. But um, uh, cool. So um, I teach in an alternative school. Um, I've been there for 21 years. It's a public alternative school. It's a high school. Um, every student um, from 9 through 12 um, can be in one classroom. So we don't differentiate grades. I'm really fortunate that I can um, create uh, my own curriculum and so from the very and I'm a language arts teacher so from the very beginning all of my classes um, regardless of what I've taught have included philosophy in some way shape or form so even if I'm doing a creative writing class we're, we're talking about uh, philosophy um, I do a lot of genre um, classes and, and film classes as well and um, and those are just great great places to to do philosophy um, I've also done a lot of and still do a lot of ethnic studies classes and um, and incorporate philosophy there as well and um, to really uh, fantastic results. Um, I was going to just kind of get into uh, the benefits and challenges during my talk and um, and then you know lessons that have worked for me. Um, but since we're all here, um, uh, I would like to point out. You'll probably see a guy on there. His name is David Shapiro. You see that guy? Just he's waving to you now. He has a really, really great book um, called Plato is Wrong, and it is full of amazing, amazing things to do with students. Um, and that wasn't on the list. Like all those other books, they're they're super cool. They're great. I'm not taking anything away from them, but Plato is Wrong should be like on your desk. Um, it's just fantastic to use. Um, whether you're teaching elementary or middle or high school. And I use it all the time. And so David, thank you so much for writing that book. I super appreciate it. <laughs> and um, 
yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you, Terrence. I am now going to introduce Wendy Way, who is a social studies teacher at Beth Page High School on Long Island, New York, where she teaches three sections of philosophy to uh, 11th and 12th graders. She's also the advisor for the philosophy club and the coach for the school's high school ethics bowl team. Wendy? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jana and Allison and Plato for inviting me to to share my experiences teaching philosophy with all of you. Um, I, I really appreciate being asked. And um, so one of the questions that I was kind of assigned to look at was, um, do you teach a standalone philosophy class or do you include philosophy as part of a larger curriculum? So I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I teach social studies at Beth Page High School on Long Island. It's a public school. And um, I've been teaching for 27 years and 20 of those years I've been teaching philosophy. And um, it just started out with a philosophy class. It was a half year class and it became a full year class. Um, then I added on a philosophy club. And then I do have two uh, teams that compete uh, for the ethics bowl in, to, in our regional ethics bowl. So for a public high school, um, and philosophy, that's like living the dream, having all of that, because it's really, it, it, like, you know, Mary Zoe said, it can be a tough sell, um, you know, in a public high school. And I'm going to talk about that when I do challenges in a, in a little bit. Um, oh, and I also forgot, um, about seven years ago, I partnered with Malloy College, which is a local college here on Long Island. Um, so my students, it's a dual enrollment, so they can get college credit for the class if they choose to. The kids do the same work, whether they get the credit or not, but um, they have the option of going for the, the credit if they'd like to. And, and that the reason I wanted to make sure I told you that is it's going to feed into when I talk about the challenges. Um, so that second part uh, that we've all been talking about was what are the benefits of introducing philosophy to high school students and what are the challenges? So I'm going to start with the challenges because I just mentioned it. Um, and really for me, especially I've, you know, I've been teaching it for 20 years, so it's, it's established in the school. It's not a problem, but the biggest problem I face is being taken seriously. Um, that, that my class is a relevant, important and important class that kids should take, um, you know, and even with an established program, I still, you know, get pushback from administrators and from guidance you know, who want to see students taking more AP classes and STEM classes. And I've had kids get um, talked out of taking philosophy so they can double up on science because it'll look better on their resume. And to me, I, I, my argument always is philosophy would look just as impressive on a resume as two sciences. You know, I, and I realize that sometimes it feeds into the major that you're looking at and things like that. But I, I, I still think it's a it's an important, you know, uh, class to take. And so, you, can, uh, you know, and, and, and anybody who teaches philosophy here, you know, probably can understand my frustration with that. And it's a fight I fight ever, every year. And, and I don't want you to think that I don't think AP and STEM aren't important. They, they are. They are important. But I think that philosophy is equally important, if not more important. Um, you know, uh, which is leading me to the benefits, because one of the biggest benefits, I think, is that um, Philosophy is the curriculum that touches all curriculums. Everything you learn in philosophy can be applied in any other class you take. You know, pre-college philosophy helps young people evaluate the world around them with a critical lens. They become better questioners, arguers, problem solvers. They evaluate information. And that only enhances the other classes that they're taking. And so, you know, uh, I, I was looking through some materials uh, I had, you know, from a, a past uh, talk that I did, and it was I, I was talking about Plato and the Republic, and it says in the Republic, Plato argues people should not begin their study of philosophy until the age of thirty, because if they engage in this practice before they are mature, there's a danger that they will develop a taste for arguing just to amuse themselves, and uh, which I thought was so funny because you know most people didn't live much past thirty during Plato's time. But anyway, um, you know, and then when I saw David Shapiro's face pop up, I my heart stopped for a second because I, I also used um, Plato was wrong, you know, and, he, and in the book, he, he argues that young people, 
you know, can do philosophy, that they are naturally curious and opinionated. And I agree. And I think that, you know, so much of a high school student's life is controlled by outside forces. You know, they're told, you know, by parents and coaches and teachers and, you know, uh, they, you know, they tell them what to do and what to think, but they don't tell them how to think. And, um, you know, and as a result, I think that a lot of teenagers feel that they don't have a voice, you know, or that their their opinions aren't valued. And that's where, you know, um, I, that's where I agree with David um, and, and not with Plato, you know, they do, they, they, when they take philosophy, uh, when students take philosophy, they really benefit on a personal level, you know, they, they become self-reflective and they become better citizens because they're, you know, questioning what's going on around them. It breaks down walls. Um, I know Roberta's on here. She was at a philosophy club meeting with me. This is several years ago. And we were talking about equality and rights. And I think gay marriage came up. And this is before it was legalized. And um, there was a one girl in, in the club. You could just body language. You could tell she was very uncomfortable with what we were talking about. And then all of a sudden, she just after like half hour, she shared this, you know, and it was brave of her. She said, you know, I, I grew up in a very homophobic household. And listening to this conversation, you know, I realized that that isn't a value I want to hold, and I, which was fabulous. You know, that was a fabulous breakthrough for her. And so I think, you know, um, that that's why philosophy is so necessary. It, if you look at the state of society today, it's sorely needed. So I'm just going to leave it there um, and say that, you know, um, I, I think we just need to see more philosophy for young people because it will ultimately help all of us not just the students themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I'm now going to introduce Dan Fouts, who is a high school social studies teacher from the Chicagoland area with 30 years of experience. He has led curriculum teams, served as departmental instructional coach, and spearheaded the creation of a philosophy elective, which he has taught for 10 years. Dan? Hi, thank you, Jana, and hello, everybody. Great to be here. So I'm going to try to just come at this from angles that haven't been been covered yet. But I, I think in terms of benefits, I mean, there's so many benefits. We're pe I'm preaching to the choir, of course, but I really think that kids walk around in high school with ideas that where they don't have a place to share them. You know, ideas about God, about how should I act, about, you know, what's the meaning of life. They don't have a forum for sharing those ideas. And I've sensed that. I mean, this is my 11th year teaching the course. And I have kids come in to class and they say, you know, we don't get to talk about any of this stuff anywhere. You know, so I think that very basic benefit that this is the class where they will talk about things that they will not discuss in any other class is a great, wonderful benefit and, and something that it's easy to take for granted. And, the, and this is kind of related to this. I mean, this pandemic, I think, has created the perfect space for philosophy because kids are coming into class, I've experienced it this year, and I'm sure we can all agree, they're different in, in how they're, they're thinking about things, how they're processing things. Um, they're much more emotional with some of their ideas. And I think philosophy is so beneficial as a way to draw out not just the intellectual, but the, the emotional side of us and to talk about ideas that are very sensitive within the context of really good conversations. And I've had so many conversations this year where the kids are bringing up their own personal experiences of what they've experienced in the pandemic and, and how it shaped them. And, and uh, we've even asked, you know, one of the first discussions we had in the, during the year was, um, at the beginning of the year was, how would a philosopher, what kind of questions would a philosopher ask about the pandemic? And what kind of questions would a scientist ask? That was 
50 minutes right there. Because that, that really established at the beginning the value of philosophy, that you're talking about things that are really connected to life in a very meaningful way. Not that science isn't at all, but they confuse the two subjects, right? So you want to establish the benefits of philosophy, I think, alongside science, not competing with it, but supporting it. And so I think that's a very specific, you know, practical lesson to maybe take away that you can, you can try. Another benefit, I, I mean, this could be 30 minutes, but I'm going to keep it short. Motivation levels. I teach, when I first got this class approved by the district, I told the district, I don't want an AP class right now. I want this to be an inclusive class that every ability level student is going to be successful in. And so I really hammered that marketing approach to the counselors. They're so tired of me. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking to them one-on-one -on -one and, and telling them, here is the type of person I would like in this class. And it's not necessarily the AP kid. I do have a handful of AP kids, but a lot of mine struggle with school. They don't do school well, but they're very creative thinkers. And so I, it is the... the, the it's a motley crew, at least the way I've marketed the class. It has so many different ab ability levels and it allows, and here's the other benefit I'm getting to, it allows kids to learn in a setting where they're, they're hearing from kids they're not used to hearing from. You know, an AP kid listening to a special ed student. I mean, I have a student who barely even speaks in class. When she does, I can't get her to be quiet, you know? It, it is a completely different context to, to have an AP student who's there every day and does the homework in a learning space with someone who struggles like that. And if there's one subject that can pull this off, it's philosophy, because it's so universal, the themes that we discuss and so on. So those are some, some benefits. I mean, I could, I could go on, but th I think that's a good little list. Challenges for me is um, you know, how to market it, get your district aware of it. I use the argument, and some, someone already said this, it serves every other subject area. It supports everything else. So I went in saying, we need better English students, math students, um, social studies students. Philosophy will help with that, with the questioning and the writing and the, and the critical thinking. And then this is a quick little tip that I found works really well once the class is in your school, because it's always a challenge to keep it, is connect with the English teachers, connect with the science teachers, and say, could I come in and, and do a 15-minute lesson on, with philosophy, with something that you're doing? That way, the kids see you talk about philosophy in another class. It is so powerful. And then when they enroll, <laughs> They see introduction to philosophy and they're like, wait a minute, that guy came into our, oh wait, yeah, I'm signing up, you know. So little things like that, I think keep it alive because at least I teach all juniors and seniors. I don't have any freshmen and sophomores, so I can't get that word out to them early. All right, so that's benefits, drawbacks. And then my question was, do I do it topic-based or, or, or text-based? I do a little bit of both. I don't give the kids long readings simply because a lot of the kids in my class will, they would struggle mightily. I love teaching through quotes. I love teaching through paragraph um, primary sources, like you know something on Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius to do Stoicism, where we can do all of it in class or, or Aristotle's stuff on friendship little excerpts I've found to be really successful. Because again, it's not an AP class for me. It's, it's very mainstreamed. And then I do by topics. I have four units. How do we know? What is reality? How should I live my life? And who am I? That's the, that's the course. We answer those, those questions. And we go through different philosopher answers to those questions. Now, the, the who am I is really a metaphysical question, but the kids, you know, they're always, they want to talk about themselves, right, and who they are. And, and so it's like, it's great with psychology, too. We have a very good psychology program in the school. 
So a lot of my, my kids have taken psychology and they, they get the philosophical perspective of psychology, which is really cool. And then so that we do those four questions, almost done here. And then their final exam is they answer the four questions for their life. What is their answer at 17 or 16 years old, where they have to show, a, demonstrate an understanding of how all of the different philosophers have answered those questions and which philosophers they agree with most. They can write something, they can do a video, they can perform something, they can do art. I've had, um, well, in the questions journal, I had two kids write a 20 page paper on artificial intelligence. They were math science students. That was their final project. So it's a great way to end the year. I say, you will never get a final exam that is more personal than this. This is yours. So, yep, that's, that's it. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm gonna introduce our last speaker, Carl Rosen, who teaches English and philosophy at Radnor High School in Pennsylvania. He serves on the Ethics Program Advisory Committee at Villanova University and is Assistant Academic Director for a Summer Program at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Carl? Thank you, Jenna, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. It's been wonderful for me to get to go last um, because I got to listen to all these really skilled people talk about their programs, and I, I hear an awful lot of overlap, which actually allows me to not say some of the things that they've already made really clear. Um, so. I actually want to start this as a as a I want to kind of take a narrative thread here. Um, in 2002, I had two students who came to me and they said, Mr. Rosen, we don't have a philosophy cl club at the school. Would you help us start one? Because you need a sponsor to start a club. And I said, sure. So these students came and, and they they wanted a club and we started meeting once a month after school. And what I found, um, what I was started thinking at the time was, huh, you know, that that kind of makes sense. They uh, a lot of kids, they graduate, they come back to visit the high school. And I always ask them because, you know, I like to live vicariously through them. I always ask them, what are you taking freshman year? What are you taking sophomore year? And, and invariably, some of the best students and actually students all over the map would say, I'm taking philosophy or I'm taking ethics. I was like, well, if they're interested in that at 19, they're probably kind of interested in it at 16 or 17. So we started this club and the club quickly grew to um, 40 35, 40 kids meeting every month. And after we met for a year, one of the projects that I put them on the second year was if we were to have a philosophy class, what would it look like? And so it started as a club project. And then in 2004, I wrote it up and presented it to the school board. And I, it's been at our public school, about 1,200 students just west of Philadelphia. It's been there ever since. Um, I haven't taught it every year. It has failed to run a couple of times. And that's going to lead into one of the challenges. Um, but um, we, we right now have uh, the largest class in the history of, uh, of philosophy at Radnor High School. Our class is called Topics in Philosophy and Writing, um, because uh, like some of the previous speakers and unlike others, I am an English teacher. So I've noticed that many of my friends who teach philosophy in other districts, they are in social studies. And that's where I, when I was in high school, I took a philosophy elective and it was a social studies class. So I wanted to make sure that this would be approved as a as an English class. And so my course is actually called philosophy and writing. And I do, it's not a tremendous amount of writing, but we do talk about, you know, clarity and organization and precision, all the things that as some of the previous speakers, um, you know, Wendy was talking about how it affects all the, all the other things that you study. And th there's, there's so much that you can do with the idea, as Dan was saying, of supporting other elements in the, in the, in the building. And so, my course is probably most like Dan's of the people who spoke before me. Um, it is, and there's a couple of different ways that, I, that I'd like to point that out. One is that I also have four units, and, but mine are organized somewhat differently. Uh, my four topics are philosophy of education, ethics, truth, logic, and argument, and aesthetics, art and music. And I always start with education because let's start with something that they know, or they think they know. And uh, on the very first day, I gather them all together. I said, get up out of your seat. They've, they've sat down and they've been sitting for two and a half minutes. And I get them up and we walk to the lobby of the school. And in the lobby, there is a plaque on the wall that someone spent a lot of money making. And it's got the school motto on it. And it says, knowledge increaseth wisdom. 
And we stand there in the hallway with all the kids walking around us wondering what exactly we're doing. And we say, is this a suitable model for a, for a high school? Uh, motto for a high school. And we talk about, well, you know, is this, do we really focus on wisdom? Is knowledge the way to increaseth wisdom? And uh, on that first day, they're up and out of their seats. We're talking about something they pass by all the time, but, um, you know, the, the unexamined life is not worth living. And uh, we want to make sure that the kids are noticing the things around them and being able to articulate um, the, their, their, sort of responses to it. They, we as philosophers, I think I'm probably speaking for everybody in this room, we want to make sure that nobody is passive and merely receptive in their thinking, that they are active, they're proactive, that they're really thinking about um, what they're doing. The um, So when I, I have a couple of specific things that I want to mention. Um, the first one is I, I really want to take the same take the same position that Dan pointed out. It was always crucial to me that this not be an honors or AP course. I have been asked several times to make it an honors and AP course or AP course. This is a, what we, we call it advanced. It's the, the, the regular level. Um, and I am always very pleased that we have a wide variety of students. There are AP students in it. There are seniors. There are also freshmen. And I added the freshman accessibility to it a couple of years ago, and it worked really, really well. Um, because the course is organized around having conversations that they can all participate in, and it is important for the AP seniors to understand that we've got to be good collaborators, we've got to be good listeners, and so it's it's useful for them to not dominate also. Freshmen do in most years, not, not the last time I taught it, but this time, most years they tend to be quiet. But um, so I, I'm very much on Dan's page that um, I want to make sure that, that these kids are um, they know they can succeed in there. And I have had students from all the tracking levels. I, I'm not a big fan of tracking, but from all the tracking levels, I don't require that students speak actively in class, but they all have, again, it's it's philosophy and writing. They have journals that they have to do, and I'm trying to push them. You got you to gotta ask better questions. You need to articulate about this. And so I, the journal is a conversation between me and, uh, and each student. Um, one of the uh, one of the key things that I want to that I do want to talk about is something I implemented a couple of years ago called Open Discussion Friday. So I teach Monday, Tuesday, and and this year I've got a double period on on Thursday, and then Friday is always a topic that the students raise. So on Thursday I say, okay, what's the open discussion topic for this week? And whatever the topic is, everybody finds an article, we all bring it in, and because the weather has been nice lately. Um, I take them and, and do a little peripatetic school and I, I walk them outside. We walk around the campus and uh, and we talk this little this little clash of, um, of philosophers walking around the outside, which uh, they like because they don't get to go outside as much as they as they would prefer. Um, and so the topics from this year, you know, things like uh, what you'd expect, grades and grading. Um, should the U.S. have pulled out of Afghanistan, uh, the intersection of social media and mental health. Um, should you care about whether the entertainers that you listen to or watch are good people? And these are all student-generated topics. But along the lines of these topics, what I don't want to do is just talk about that topic. So, you know, we'll talk for a little while, and then I'll introduce a topic like moral hazard, or it'll just come up, a significant distinction, logical extension. I want them to be able to speak the language somewhat. So that's that's me trying to be dynamic, working my way in, and we'll pause our discussion and say, okay, what's the logical extension of this? And so we'll use some of the philosophical terminology uh, to try to to try to make it um, not just a a conversation. And again, I think I th think Dan talked about um, some of this too. Another benefit that we have uh, is that I think a lot of you probably do have is we are close to a university and I established a uh, relationship with an absolutely wonderful philosophy and ethics department at Villanova University who very generously have allowed our students to come and participate in classes. Once a year we go and, um, and we sit in a class that the professor emails me the, the reading, we talk about it a little bit in my class and we go and the students realize, and this I think is really important to what Dan and I were saying, not all these students are fully convinced that they are ready for college, especially the freshmen, especially the kids who are not of the AP honors level. But they go there and they realize, wow, I can actually understand and even compete with, not really compete, but compete with what these college students are doing. And Villanova is a fine school. So I'm incredibly grateful for Villanova 
and uh, they are only five minutes from us by bus, and it's it's just a wonderful thing. So if there's a way that you can make a connection with a professor there, we've had things about um, uh, the Pope's uh, the Pope's encyclical about about um, uh, climate change. We talked about feminism. We're doing healthcare professionals ethics um, in in a couple of weeks. Um, the question that I was asked to uh, talk about, and then I've got to. Uh, I'm going to close with my story of how being shamed changed my course. I want to share my screen here um, to show you about how I promote the course, because as I said, it hasn't run every year, and that has really been frustrating. Let's see here. So a couple of years ago, they, the, they asked to put together they asked the teachers to put, who teach electives to put together a, um, you know, something to help the middle schoolers pick courses. And this is when my course had, was opened up to middle schoolers also. They're, you know, kids don't really read the program of studies. But I want to make, I, I want to kind of fight back against the stereotype that I think we're all aware of that philosophy is sort of this solipsistic thing, that it's, that it's not all the serious, um, valuable stuff that all the previous speakers had to to talked about. So I found all these articles. Um, and, uh, you know, there, you want to be good in business philosophy, you know, you, you want to be hired at Google philosophy, you know, and, and all of these people, here's Mark Cuban from Sharp Tank talking about how he looks for philosophy majors. Um, George Soros was a philosophy major. And if that's too liberal for you, Peter Thiel is a philosophy major. If that's too conservative for you, you know, and there's all of these people, um, that this Huffington Post article, by the way, which is worth Googling. That is um, that is a really good one. It's got all sorts of terrific, uh, terrific ideas. But entrepreneurialism is is very much in the mind of uh, in the mind of philosophy um, professionals and rather philosophy students. Um, and uh, well, here's Zeno down in the corner here. You know, we uh, there is a tremendous call out there, not necessarily for professors of philosophy. I understand. No offense, John, Jana, but um, you know, there's the this is. It's wonderful that we have educational training in philosophy, but you don't have to become a philosopher if you have philosophy training. And I think that, um, I, you know, I'm a little, uh, I don't always love the idea of, of talking about it in such practical terms, but it is, it has been useful. It is valuable. Um, and the enrollments have really increased. In fact, we had so many that I had two sections last year for the first time ever. And then the pandemic canceled all our electives so we could make everything um, make everything smaller, which is kind of too bad. Um, I do want to, uh, I've got two quick things to do. First, I'm putting in the chat um, three books that have been really useful to me. The Philosophy Gym by Stephen Law and The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten. Both have really short um, examples. They're both excellent books. The textbook I used to use, it's kind of, it's out of print, unfortunately, but I think you can get some used copies, but it's very much worthwhile. Thinking and Writing About Philosophy by, um, by Hugo Bedeau, it's from um, Bedford St. Martin's, really great book. Um, and for, especially for a writing course, he has all sorts of things there. But um, I, I was able to go to University of Washington a couple of years ago and, and speak at the conference. And I was very fortunate, the keynote speaker that year was um, Jonathan Kozel, the, the great um, journalist of, of education. And he happened, he came to my, um, my presentation, which was about my class, and asked me a question that I had a, no answer to. And it changed the way that I thought about the course. He says, well, it's great that you're having students think about the world. And what are you having them do? What are you making them do? And I, you know, I kind of yammered around helplessly for a little while, but I realized that he's right, that it makes a lot of sense to have them not only think and talk about these things, which they do with, with, um, you know, with great energy. We have wonderful discussions all the time. So my final for the course is called Kozel's Challenge. And the goal is that each student has to propose, has to devise and propose a project where they have to make a significant difference in something. Um, I've had kids plant trees. I've had kids, um, you know, do volunteer work. And what they need to do is accompany that with a with a, a an essay, something writing that has to use some philosophical um, backing. So maybe what would Immanuel Kant say about this kind of thing? Or, or you know, let's talk about um, you know the the year that we did it with the Pope um, that, that we did the Pope's encyclical, the, the Laudato Si. Um, how did it, how does that, uh, how do you, what's your philosophical backing for working on behalf of the climate? So uh, they have to write something, 
And um, again, it's something that kids can do no matter what their ability level. Some will do it more kind of professionally than others. I'm trying to get more kids apply to send in stuff to questions this year. So uh, thank you for, for putting that out there. But um, that's, uh, that's pretty much what we do here. And, um, and I'm just, you know, really excited to see so many people are interested in, in, in philosophy for, for young people, uh, because the kids may not realize how much they are interested in it. And the more schools they have it available, um, the better for us as a society. Thanks so much, Carl. Um, before I talk about the breakout rooms and we move into the next part of this program, I'm going to put Terrence on the spot a little bit. And Terrence, you can decline if you'd like. Um, but since you didn't speak for very long, I was just going to ask you if you wouldn't mind talking about your beautiful songs um, lesson, because I have found it to be so powerful. And I know many students have. So would you mind just speaking briefly about that? Sure. Um, I. I used to teach a class called The Beauty of Dysfunction. And so we would watch films and we would look for characters in the films that were fairly despicable. Um, and we would look for beauty in them. And um, uh, one filmmaker that, um, that does this pretty well is uh, Wes Anderson. And so um, we had, uh, and, and he always has like a pretty great soundtrack and, and things like that, if you like that particular kind of music. And, and so one of the things that I did is I just, um, I asked the kids, I said, look, however old you are, and remember, I can have nine through 12th graders in my classes, right? Um, so they're all in the same class together, learning from each other. Um, like many others said, I, I don't have any AP classes. I would, I don't think I would ever even teach an AP class. Um, so I take anybody that wants to come to my class. I don't care who they are or what accommodations they need. Um, uh, I individuate for every single kid that comes to the class. So, um, but in this particular uh, assignment, um, however old they are, they have to choose that many number of songs that they believe are the most beautiful songs ever written. Um, uh, and, and then they have to choose one song that they believe is the worst song or the ugliest song that they've ever heard. And, um, and it was, and then they have to write, they have to, they have to justify it a little bit. They have to write a few sentences about each one. And um, uh, when I met Jana, we were talking about it and Jana was like, I could have my students in my classroom do the exact same thing. And then we could bring our classes together at the University of Washington. And, um, and we did. And, um, and much like Carl is talking about, you know, I have a lot of kids, they never have ever thought that they would go to college, um, even community college, and, um, and they would walk onto the UW campus and, and look at it in awe. I mean, they would just be like, this place is incredible. And then they would go into, they would go into an educational building, and then they would sit with these, these college students, and they would they would give as good as they could get, you know, like they, and it was really, really beautiful to watch. And then, um, you know, and everybody was sharing and Jana and, and, and David was always there too. You know, we would, we would bring this class together and um, we'd mix the kids up um, into groups and, um, uh, and they would play their music. That was the other thing that was really cool. So they would play pieces of their, and then they would talk about them and, and everybody would shoot their hands up. Everybody, you know, wanted like from the college students down to the high school students, everybody wanted to be a part of it. And it was really super cool. And the great thing about it is even afterwards, when we would go back on the bus, um, uh, you know, on the city bus, we would be going back. And I mean, it was just nonstop, like how amazing that was and how incredible it was. And then I've just had so many students just even from that experience decide like, I can go to college, I can do this, right? And so, so yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for giving me that opportunity. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. And I'll just echo that. It was really, I mean, and, and really philosophically rich too. I mean, all these conversations about beauty and how personal it is and, and, and ugliness and the relationship between beauty and ugliness, it was just phenomenal. So anyway, I highly recommend it as a lesson plan for high school teachers and college teachers too, and anyone for that matter. I've actually done it with my friends and it's pretty fun. 
Okay, so we are going to go into breakout rooms. And the idea is for everyone to, you should be getting an invitation and you can choose which breakout room you would like to attend. The breakout rooms are named with the names of the five presenters. And so basically go into a breakout room where you have particular questions or have something you wanna talk about with that presenter. Um, the presenters should all already be assigned to those rooms. If while anyone is in the breakout rooms, you have a question or you need some help, just, just send a message. You can send a message to us and um, one of us will come and help. And you'll have about 25 minutes or so in the breakout rooms and I'll send a, a message when you have three minutes left and then you'll get a message that they'll close in 60 seconds and they'll close automatically and we'll all be back together at that point. Looks like I think everyone is back. Um, well, welcome back everyone. And thanks again for being with us this evening. I hope the conversations in the breakout rooms were fruitful and um, wanted to say if anyone has any final questions or thinks of a question that they didn't ask after we're finished here feel free to send it to Plato and we will forward it on to the panelists or if it's something Plato can answer we'll try to do that as well um, and actually Kate maybe you could put Plato's e uh, email address just in the chat so it's easy for people to access um, I also wanted to mention that I noticed during the talks that someone had put on the chat an idea for an ideal K through 12 public school toolkit. So anyone who wants to can find that in the chat and click on it. Um, and I think that's all that I have to say. Other, if, does anyone have any final questions or things we haven't addressed that we should address? Otherwise, I'll let Allison say a few things. And thanks again, everyone, for being here. Yeah, I'll just say just a quick um, reminder to uh, follow us on social media, follow Plato on social media, and uh, look for our newsletters in your email for upcoming events that we'll sponsor. I also put a link to a description of our upcoming conference in June for anyone who is interested. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. And a big thank you to our panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your expertise. Um, that was so special, so special. Thanks to everyone. Have a good evening.